big harvest meal right after the service. And uh, I'll probably remind you later too, we're gonna have communion today, but it's gonna be downstairs just prior to the meal. So let's try not to dilly-dally up here too much. And if you'll stand, we'll begin this morning's worship.
Father, we just lift you up today. Father, I pray in our hearts that we would all make our stand. And Father, that our arms would be raised high before you. Lord, that we celebrate, Lord, our relationship with you and with your son, Jesus. And Lord, just how thankful we are for all that you do for us. And Father, you've made a way to you through your son. A gift beyond compare. Father, be lifted up here this morning. Jesus, be lifted up in the praises of your people. In Jesus' name. Dear King, I thank you so much for this lovely day that you've gathered your church here in this building, and I thank you for the gifts that people will put in these bags for to further your kingdom. In your name I pray, amen.
will stand for our doxology, please. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. What a joy to tarry with the Lord in worship. And I love that word in the hymn there, in the garden. The joy we share as we tarry there, and it's really with Christ. And he's present in the praises of his people. So it's just uh, a blessing to really come together and to uh, experience this fellowship with one another and with Christ. Uh, just welcome. We have a few visitors here There's this morning. So welcome for you guys. <laughs> Sonia, you're flanked there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Welcome, you guys, and Shane, and uh, any other. We got the crew over here, and that's great having you guys back. Uh, a few announcements for us. It is our harvest meal Sunday, and so the food's going to, the smell's going to be wafting up here toward the end of the service, so um, I'm prepared for that. Uh, for the, we want to be able to head down right after the service. We are going to take, it's going to be a little bit different this year because we're going to take communion downstairs right before the meal. And in the early church in the scriptures, we see that they often met in the evening and they would share communion and then have a love feast together. And the communion was part of actually the bigger meal that they had uh, for, for dinner. And so we're going to do that in a sense. We're going to go down. So right after the service ends, the closing songs, I'll dismiss everybody. Hopefully everybody can stay here. Uh, come on down. We'll take communion together as a church family, and then we'll go right into our meal. Okay, you'll also see the shoeboxes are up here. And so thank you all for bringing, bringing them in. What kids were working on the shoeboxes? Raise your hand if you're a kid here and you're working on a shoebox. Charlotte, Sophia? <laughs> They're getting a little older for that, though. All right. Well... Some of our kids don't want to admit to be kids, I think is what's happening. All right. Well, uh, just thank you guys for bringing those in. We do want to pray for those. It's really an amazing ministry. Those boxes go out to kids all over the world and really make a difference for eternity. And if you hear Franklin Graham speak, he said, you know, it's a shoebox, but it's much more than that because it's an opportunity for that child to really have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's the goal of that. It's not just toys. It's, it's actually Jesus. And the shoebox becomes really a means to that um, and provides, you know, great, great joy uh, this time of year for the kids. So um, if you haven't brought your shoebox in yet, you can still do so. Um, we're going to actually be taking them over to Genesis Church, which is the sending church for those, on Saturday. So if you get it back here by Saturday... Uh, it'll go out. There's also a packing party on Saturday. Pat, do you want to share anything about that for the yeah, church here? You guys are free. We're going to go shopping later this week and buy a bunch of toys and stuff. So it's going to be you guys, especially. And we're going to put some shoeboxes together Saturday at 10. Mm -hmm. Plus, I bought a table for the rest of the Plus, I love snacks and just eating. You'll never have a better time in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's for any age, right? So kids can go, um, teenagers, college age, adult. Hmm? I could. Yeah. Although I won't be here, actually. Um, and just a heads up, my family and I are going on vacation this week, and so we'll be gone for that. But, uh, but you can go if you're here. I encourage you to do that. Okay. Any other announcements that we have? Go yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that, are you saying like the snow melting or is, <laughs> so who was excited, who was thankful when you saw the snow this morning? All right, all right, that's good, that's good. All right, give thanks in everything, right? All right, 
All right, we're going to pray, and oh, we have another announcement? Yeah. Rachel. Okay, all right. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, let's pray. Uh, there's a lot of needs, of course, in our congregation, community. You see the prayer insert in your bulletin. Uh, make sure to read through that and pray for different things. That reminds me, too, uh, Dale and Jan, this will be your last Sunday here for some time uh, as you guys are heading down to Florida. So we want to remember uh, Dale and Jan in our prayers as well. And we'll pray for all these shoe boxes too as they go out. And, and also for the packing party as all those go out. Hopefully, um, we trust we'll make an impact for the kingdom. So let's pray. Uh, Father, you are just uh, so good to us in, in really every way. And Lord, we thank you for just the revelation of that. And that is uh, true even in every situation in life, no matter what happened this past week. Uh, challenges, heartaches, um, trials that we have faced. We know that your goodness remains and is, is true in all these things. So, Lord, uh, we pray just with uh, grateful hearts to be able to gather together, to be able to worship you, to uh, that Jesus would be lifted up as he was lifted up on the cross to draw all men to him. Lord, we know that we are drawn to you through your spirit as we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ this morning. And so, Lord, we pray that you administer to each person here during the time of the service, through the song and the scripture, the message, uh, all the different uh, things, even, even the meal and the fellowship, Lord, that it would all be uh, a way of you drawing us closer to you. And we know that that is your heart, that you would be our God and that we would be your people. So help us, Lord, to respond, Lord, in, in uh, faith and drawing near to you. Uh, we pray for the needs that have dimension. We know there's many people in our community that uh, need your help. Uh, and Lord, you're calling us to serve in various ways to help meet those needs. So let us be responsive uh, and obedient to those things. We pray, Lord, for uh, Dale and Jan as they're going to be traveling. And that we just ask for your blessing on them as they are being uh, sent uh, down to Florida to uh, minister. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that um, you would Put them to service in, in every way that you have for them. And, Lord, we look forward to being able to see them again uh, in the springtime. Uh, we do pray for the, all these shoe boxes too, that are going out. And uh, we trust, Lord, that they're going to go to the, just the right child that, is, uh, that you have in mind. And, Lord, that will make an impact for eternity. We pray that children's lives would be changed uh, forever um, through hearing the gospel and through these shoe boxes. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be... Uh, to have a role in it, and Lord, it's just, in our view, it's just fishes and loaves, just presenting what we can, Lord, trusting that you will make all, you will make all the real impact uh, through your uh, hand on, on, this, on their lives. Uh, Lord, guide and direct our remainder of our time together, our meal, all of this, we pray that it would be done for your honor, for your glory. Lord, let us leave here changed people because we have spent time in your presence here this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to send our little ones down for nursery. And we have Abby and Josh are going to be uh, running the nursery this morning. And for the rest of you, if you can get your Bibles out, and we're going to be in Numbers chapter 15. Numbers 15.
So everybody should be turning to Numbers chapter 15. As you turn, I came across this. I don't know if I shared it yet, but uh, does anybody know the least favorite book of the Bible? It's Leviticus. Anybody know the second least favorite book of the Bible? Numbers. <laughs> so uh, my goal, hopefully, prayerfully, is that that will not be true for this congregation. And as we're going through Numbers, um, really we see Christ here everywhere. Uh, the, really, the entire Bible is encapsulated in many ways through the book of Numbers, and I hope that you guys are catching that as we go through here. I've been uh, just amazed, really, going through and seeing Jesus in ways that I had never seen before, and uh, it's just, there's, it's so full and comprehensive. My biggest challenge every week is actually fitting things in in a reasonable amount of time to be able to share, and there's just so rich in content. The last week, we looked at two chapters, uh, chapters of failure, really. Remember, they were right on the border of going into the Promised Land at Kadesh Barnea, and they sent out the 12 spies to go out and check out the land. Remember what they brought back? A big cluster of grapes, and it took, actually, two men with poles to be able to bring the one cluster of grapes back. So a very fruitful land. Uh, the land flowing with milk and honey is all that God had said that it was, and it was right there for them. And the people that were in the land were actually uh, afraid, really, of God's people because they had heard the report from uh, the Exodus. And so it was all there for the taking, but they sent the 12 spies. How many came back with the bad report? Ten. How many came back with the good report? Two. Who were the two that came back with the good report? Joshua and Caleb. Who were the ten that came back with the bad report? Nobody cares anymore, right? Um, we, we care about Joshua and Caleb because they were men of faith and courage. They did not have mistrust, but they trusted God and his word, and they were able then to act boldly and courageously because of that. And so that's what we looked at last week. And um, this week, um, we're going to just, let me just sum up a little bit, and we'll kind of start off in chapter 15. But there's a plague that happened. Those ten spies were killed, and uh, God's people were still complaining. They'd rather be in Egypt than enter the Promised Land. They'd rather have a different leader of their own choosing than the one God had chosen for them. And Moses, God told them then to go back to the wilderness. And he said, your children, though, will enter the land. And they said, no, we will not accept the Lord's punishment. And this is a... a uh, dangerous spot to be in. God says, I'm going to discipline you, and they say, no. How many parents, if you say, we're going to be disciplined, and the child says, no, that's not a good day for that child, right? <laughs> and here, this, God, they're saying, we will, we will enter the promised land. And God says, well, you're being disobedient again, because I told you actually that you're not to go into the promised land. And so Moses says, if you don't obey then the Amalekites and the Canaanites will destroy you because you have turned from following the Lord. And so they went up anyway, and they, of course, they were, de they were uh, beaten back uh, after that. So now we come to chapter 15, and this is really an oasis in a desert. Uh, it's a chapter of grace. If you notice, the sermon title is Grace, and it's really um, an amazing chapter in the book of Numbers. So everybody should be there, Numbers 15. I'll read verses 1 and 2. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land, you are to inhabit which I am giving you. Now, we'll hold on just for a moment here. Remember, God said you're not going in the land. In fact, you're going to die in the wilderness. But now he's saying, When you go into the land, who is he talking to? The children. And so this is, he's saying, Really, teenagers, young people, listen up because now I have a word for you. And the young people are really to be paying attention. The older generation is going to all die off, but the younger generation is going to go in. And this, is, this chapter is actually for teenagers, really. This is that they're to be paying attention and listening to this because the promises that God has for them in Numbers 15 are actually not for the adult generation. It's for the younger generation. And so... Um, uh, God is going to be faithful to his promises for this next generation. And what we see here then in verse uh, 2, the land I'm giving to you. And, you. and you offer to the Lord from the herd 
or from the flock a food offering or a burnt offering or a sacrifice to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering at, or at your appointed feast to make a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So what we're seeing here now is that uh, there's several new laws that are being given and there's several new offerings that are being uh, told to be given as well. And there's a, we're going to run through here, there's a variety of them. Some of them are voluntary or free will. There's table offerings, there's dough offerings, there's atonement for sin offerings, there's grain offerings, and there's drink offerings. And so uh, they're listing out here, you're going to have an abundance in the land, but out of that abundance, that there's offerings that are expected to be given to the Lord. In verse 3, it talks about a burnt offering, and that word means literally what goes up. Or what goes up in smoke? How many say, I've, I've had some burnt offerings to the Lord? Hopefully we're not having that uh, today for the, the meal. Uh, but uh, that was an offering that was totally consumed. And every burnt offering then was supposed to be accompanied by a grain offering and a drink offering. And so verses 4 through 13, they really lay all this out, uh, the different offerings. The drink offering is an interesting one. And you may recall that from the New Testament. Remember Paul at the end of his life in 2 Timothy, the last letter that he wrote? He said, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. So this is language back to Numbers 15. He said, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And so what he's saying is that the drink offering is it's all in. You pour it all out. And Paul's saying, I've poured out my whole life. I've given everything. Um, like a drink offering that's been given wholly then devoted to the Lord. I'm all in. How many can say that this morning? I'm all in for Jesus. That's, that's the thing. Is, that's the goal at the, at the end of our life that we can say that. Not at the, not at the middle of your life, but at the end of your life. That you can say, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, all in. Charles Spurgeon had said this, Most Christians, as to the river of experience, are only up to the ankles. Some others have waited till the stream is up to the knees. A few find it breast high, and but a few, oh, how few, find it a river to swim in, the bottom of which they cannot touch. And how, what is your experience like in Jesus Christ? Are you just knee, is it just ankle deep? Is it knee deep, waist deep? Or are you swimming? And that's really, that's Paul, I'm all in. I'm taking a swim in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm... I'm totally in. Verse uh, 14 through 16 now lays out um, uh, some instructions for the stranger. So this is for the non-Jewish person. If a stranger is sojourning with you, remember they came out with a mixed multitude, others that came out from Egypt, said, if it, or anyone is living permanently among you and he wishes to offer a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord, he shall do as you do. For the assembly there shall be one statute for you and, one, and for the stranger who sojourns with you, a statute forever throughout your generations. You and the sojourner shall be alike before the Lord. One law and one rule shall be for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you. So what he's really saying here is uh, this is a picture of um, really the promise of Abraham being given to the blessing, being a blessing to the nations. And that the, that the strangers, those that are with them, are able then to also participate in this. And it's really a, um, a picture of future things. Remember, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. And that means uh, that we're one ecclesia, really, or one church. And so this is really a, a future picture of that. But there's instructions that are given for the offerings that are to be given. In verses 17 through 21, it talks about a dough offering. How many know the term that um, dough being money, right? I don't have any dough. So this is the, this is the offering, uh, first fruits of the grain. In verse 22, <laughs> uh, it talks about unintentional and then going on to intentional offering. So I want to pause here. If you take a look at verse 22, it says, But if you sin unintentionally and do not observe all these commandments that the Lord has spoken to Moses. Remember, there's 613 commands that were given, sometimes there would be unintentional sin. It's not something 
they intended to do, but it's something that they did anyway. Now, how many know if you sin unintentionally, you're not off the hook? Okay, just like if you, if you speed and you get caught, pulled over for speeding and you tell the officer, well, I didn't know what the speed limit was, what's he going to say? Well, now you do, right? Now you know. I'm still giving you a ticket, right? Can you get off because simply you, you didn't know? Can you plead ignorance? Well, you can plead it, but you still broke the law, right? And so, but it's different than if the person said, yeah, I know what the speed is, and I purposely chose to go much faster than it. I mean, say, that's a different, it's a little bit different, isn't it? So the Bible lays out unintentional sin and intentional sin. Uh, unintentional sin, verse 22 uh, listed out there, but if you sin un unintentionally and do not observe all these commandments that the Lord has spoken to Moses, all that the Lord has commanded you by Moses from the day that the Lord gave commandment and onward throughout your generations, then if it was done unintentionally without the knowledge of the congregation, all the congregation shall offer one bull from the herd for a burnt offering, a pleasing aroma to the Lord with its grain offering and its drink offering according to the rule, and one male goat for a sin offering. So it's saying someone who sins unintentionally, it's became, uh, people are aware of it. Then there's a grain offering, a drink offering, and a sacrifice of an animal that is to be given along with that. And so um, it's very clear then that God does not just ignore unintentional sin. And sin ultimately is, um, well, in the Greek is harmatia, which is missing the mark. You may have heard the term uh, like an arrow that misses the target. And in that, you'll notice a sacrifice has to be made. And the reason is because without the, there cannot be forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And this is why there has to be a sacrifice. And what God's people are learning through this is that if you transgress his law, if you break his law, it's going to cost you something. And this is an important lesson. Remember, 1 Corinthians 10 says that all these things that were done in the wilderness, they were all done for our instruction. So what are we to learn from that? And I want to submit to you that the first thing that we can learn from it is that sin was expensive. Remember, he's saying teenagers, you're going to get to the land, it's going to be abundant land, but there's going to be a reduction in the abundance because every time you sin, you're going to actually have to, there's going to be a cost involved. There's grain, there's drink, there's an animal sacrifice. You're going to reduce some of the abundance because of the sin in your life, meaning sin is expensive. Now, how many would say sin has been expensive in my life? There's been a cost to it. And this is the lesson for us to learn. What does it reduce? What does sin reduce in our life? It's going to reduce your relationship with Christ, isn't it? It won't be the same. There's going to be some separation there. It's going to reduce your relationship with other people. Sin is expensive, really, before God. If someone commits adultery, is there a cost there? Absolutely there is. It's going to destroy marriages and families. If someone lies, is there a cost there? Yes, there is. Someone's testimony will not be credible anymore, and it will hurt people, and it will destroy your own reputation. There's always a cost to sin. And the Bible is in, it's laid out here very purposely so that God's people would understand that. It also means you can only prosper if you live God's ways. Otherwise, your sin will be an expensive habit. And that, that is true. But take a look at verse 26. Or 25 and 26. It says, And the priests shall make atonement for all the congregation of the people of Israel, and they shall be forgiven. Because it was a mistake. And they have brought their offering, a food offering, to the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their mistake. And all the congregation of the people of Israel shall be forgiven, and the stranger who sojourns among them, because the whole population was involved in the mistake. And so, notice here, there's still a price to be paid. There's still an expense that's given. But there's also atonement. And I think that this is amazing here, too. How much did, uh, how uh, we look at atonement that we find in Christ, what did it cost you? Nothing, right? The sin is still expensive, though. There's a price to be paid, but grace says it's freely given to you. 
And this is an amazing thing. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had talked about cheap grace. And this is the Christian who just says, well, my sin is forgiven, so I'm just going to willfully just sin anyway. How many say, that does not honor God, does it? And in fact, it's cheap grace. And even Paul says, should we, should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? No. Heavens no. In fact, if you're truly a Christian, it will break your heart when you sin because you will know that you have, uh, you have offended God, that you have sinned against him. So there's atonement, though, that is provided here. And that is found in numbers, and we see that really fulfilled in, uh, or found in, in Jesus Christ as well. But watch this in verse, uh, let's see, 30. It says, the person who does anything, but the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be utterly cut off, his iniquity shall be on him. And so here we have, uh, there's unintentional sin, there's offerings, there's sacrifice, it's forgiven. There's also those sin that is intentional. Now this is a little bit different. This is when you sin with a high hand. And what that means is it's basically like a hand raised in defiance against God. And this is, the attitude is basically, I'm going to sin anyway, what are you going to do about it? And you can see the, the pride that is here. And the teenagers who are listening to this are like, oh no, like, well, what is an example of a high-handed sin? Because the penalty here is to be cut off from the people. So that's serious. And the teenagers are like, we want to know an example of that. So actually, there's an example given here of a Sabbath breaker who is executed. If you look in verse 32, this shows a high-handed sin example, Okay. So when the, while the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. Big deal or not a big deal? It turns out it is going to be a big deal. Is he just doing yard work? No, there's something a little bit more going on here, right? And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him in custody because it had not been made clear what should be done to him. And the Lord said to Moses, The man shall be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones as the Lord commanded Moses. So was this guy just, act, uh, just out gathering sticks unintentionally, didn't know that he was sinning? No, because actually there would be offerings that would be given and there would be forgiveness that would be offered there, right? This is a high-handed sin. This is something very different. This is an example of a man who's basically got his fist to God and is saying, I know what the laws are. I'm going to do it my way anyway. Now we might say, well, what's the big deal about, about breaking the Sabbath? And let me take you to Exodus 35 because there's actually more significance to it. It says, six days shall, this is Exodus 35, 2 and 3. It says, six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. So here's, this is the situation. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. So this man gathering sticks, one, he's working, but two, he's gathering sticks to light a fire. That's most likely what the situation is. Watch this. Out. Why kill someone who doesn't follow the Sabbath? Why is that one so severe? And the reason is given, actually, in Exodus 31, where it says, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is, because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. So why is the Sabbath so important? And the reason is given, it's a sign between you and me. And so the man gathering sticks, wanting to build a fire, basically for all to see, is parading his rebellion against God. And he's really saying he's rejecting the covenant then, saying that, that of belonging to God. So th that's why it's so important. The Sabbath actually is that sign that, that the people belong to God. If they defy that, they're essentially saying, I don't want to belong to you anymore. And that's why they would be cut off. So question for us. 
but why aren't we keeping the Sabbath today? And why aren't we stoning people who don't keep the Sabbath? I'll share with you, who is our Sabbath rest? Or where is it found? It's found in Jesus, isn't it? It's in Matthew 11, it says, Come unto me, and you will find rest for your souls, right? And that word is Sabbath. As we come unto Jesus, actually, we are finding rest. Remember, the new covenant is all magnified. It's not one day a week anymore. It's every day. What was the punishment for disobeying the Sabbath in the old covenant? Death. What is the penalty or punishment for disobeying the, the command of Christ to come unto me in the new covenant? Death, right? It's actually the same thing. If you reject that covenant relationship that we have through Christ, then actually you're going to face the same penalty. And the old covenant was remember written for our instruction. Why was it so important? Because God wants to be our God and that we would be his people. And if we reject that, then the penalty is clear. Old Testament and New Testament, it's actually the same. We're not under the Sabbath laws anymore, or we would have to be stoned for not keeping them. Which, who drove their car yesterday? If you drove your car yesterday, you actually lit a fire in your engine, right? And you are guilty of that. But we're not under that anymore. We are under Christ. And the penalty, though, will remain if we do not come unto him. And so we find our Sabbath rest in him. Amen? The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And he made that very clear. I want you to catch here, church, that there's a danger of this pride of this high-handed sin. And this is really disrespecting God in even the smallest things. And thinking that you know better. And I think we've all had those intentional sins in our lives. I trust, I believe that, that you have. I sure have uh, at times. And it's a very dangerous thing. And we think, of why would, why would we stick our fist to God when he knows so much better than we do? But that's what we do when we intentionally sin anyway. If you think about it, the Bible says love is patient, right? But when we're not patient with who we love and how we love, and we say we want our own plans, and we say, I've got this one. Basically, God, I know you create planets, but I, I, know, I know better than you right now. I mean, that's essentially what, what we're saying. And we see that that is a high-handed sin. And it's one that, that God does not take lightly. Pride says, I'm going to pick up sticks even when God says to rest. It also may say, I'm going to rest when God says to work. And it's, it's the disobedience when God has given a clear command and we say, I'm going to do it my way anyway. And the Bible says about this, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's the difference, is really the person's heart. Why was that man uh, stoned? He, God was opposing him because of his pride, really. And we see then the, the wonderful promise of that he gives grace to the humble. That there is atonement that is here that's given. Uh, Jesus gives us uh, his grace to forgive us of our sins. And that's it's an amazing thing. We see this really very clearly uh, through these scriptures. I want to share with you just a little bit more, and we'll wrap up our time here. If you take a look at verse 37, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which are inclined to whore after. So sh you shall remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of e the land of Egypt to be your God, and I am the Lord your God. And so right away here we're going into really... Uh, a way that you can remember God's commands, and that would be the tassels. Now, the tassels, and you may even see that some of the Orthodox Jews, other people will actually have um, a tassel hanging from the four corners of their, of their clothing. It had a blue cord in the center, and it was really a visual reminder. It was a way to hold yourself publicly accountable in a way, and it'd be a reminder that you're under God's commandments. It, it's very similar to a wedding ring in a lot of ways. 
It's a reminder to yourself that you're married, which you may need from time to time. And it's a reminder to others that you are married, meaning back off, right? You're married. And that's, that's the thing. Now, we have other reminders that we do. Maybe you have a Christian fish on your car, or you wear a Christian hat, or bumper, or a um, shirt, or something like that. What are you doing? You're reminding yourself that you're a Christian, and you're telling other people, right? So the tassels were something like that, but in this case, it's a little bit deeper. They were um, a visual representation that you were a Jewish person submitted to the Torah, okay? And so it was really you're showing your identity then as a Jew, and the Jewish people will still wear these tassels. Even Jesus wore them. Uh, why? Because he was Jewish, right? And the woman who touched the hem of his garment that is actually the tassels that were hanging down. And so he was obedient to uh, the law of Moses because the Torah is for the Jew. But Christ is for the world. I want you to catch this here, church. This is a really important point. When we think about we're heading into Christmas time, right? Remember the announcement that was given to the shepherds? What was it? That this is good news of great joy for who? For the Jews? For all people, which should be for all people. When the curtain was torn down from top to bottom, what is, this, what is God saying? What did he say by doing that? All have access now. It's not just the high priest on one day. All have access now to Jesus. The gospel came first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, right? The Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost. That's, the Jewish, that's when uh, a Jewish Pentecost, really. But later, the Holy Spirit came down at Cornelius' house, which is also now referred to as the Gentile Pentecost, really. And then the Gentiles were receiving the Holy Spirit. The Jewish people are like, but they haven't become Jewish yet. Do they need to keep the Sabbath? Do they need to do the tassels? Do they need to do all these things? And the answer really is, no, they do not. And because the, what Jesus is saying here is that, that he has come for all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? And we see here that God loved Israel, and he gave them the Torah. And the Jewish people were keeping that. Even Jesus kept that. But God so loved the world that he gave his son. And this is the, the difference, really. If I be lifted up, I will draw how many men? Just the Jewish men? All men, to me. Jesus was crucified where? In the temple? Or outside the temple? Outside the temple. Why? Because... He, he didn't, wasn't crucified in the Holy of Holies because he was actually the, the sacrifice, our atoning sacrifice for all people, not just the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. And this is really the reminder that we are in Christ now, and he has come for all people. And there's a, a difference here between law and grace. Remember in Isaiah 53, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. We are uh, with his wounds, or by his wounds, we are healed. And so Jesus came actually for all people. What did he do? He bore our sins on, on himself. And the Bible then says that law, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. And that in the law, even here in Numbers 15, it all points really to Jesus Christ. Is sin expensive? Yes, it is. I'm going to remind you by, by you're going to reduce your abundance every time you sin so you can know that there's a cost that's here. Is sin still expensive? It is. Is there atonement, though, when we sin? Is there forgiveness? Is there grace? Yes, there is. Did it come at a cost? Not to you, not to me, but it did to, to God himself. Did, who did he come for? Who is this gift offered to? Do you have to become Jewish? Do you have to keep the Sabbath? Do you have to wear tassels? Or do you have to know Christ? Do you have to, find, do you have to receive Jesus Christ? Is he your rest then? Are you under the command of Christ now? This is... This is grace and truth now through Jesus Christ. You do not have to become Jewish. You actually need Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel, the good news that's given. And, and we see God's heart is the same here, here as it is 
<laughs> always. In verse 41, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be whose God? Your God, right? I am the Lord your God. Is it personal? 100%. It's very personal. And this is really the, the heart of God, really, that he would be our God. What did he do to be your God? He gave everything, right? He gave it all. And what will our response be that, to that? We've been welcomed in. We've been invited in. And we know that the gospel first went to the Jew, but then to the Gentile. And we're now counted among that. And the only currency, the only way that we have to pay for that is the only way we, or the only thing we can offer, I should say, is really our thanksgiving. And so this is going to be a thank, this is actually a thanksgiving sermon. You didn't know that, but it is. <laughs> All right. First Timothy 1, Paul's response to the gospel coming to him. He said, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. He had a high hand to God. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And this means that Paul used his crazy past, blaspheming, persecuting Christians, all this really to guide his gratitude and thanksgiving. Why? Because he had been given grace and mercy through the cross, and he knew it. The story here, a Puritan pastor wrote this insightful letter to his son. He said, when I was threatening to become cold in my ministry, and when I felt Sunday morning coming, and my heart not filled with amazement at the grace of God, or when I was making ready to dispense of the Lord's Supper, do you know what I used to do? I used to take a turn up and down among the sins of my past life, and I always came down again with a broken and contrite heart, ready to preach, as it was preached in the beginning, the forgiveness of sins. I do not think I ever went to the pulpit stair that I did not stop for a moment at the foot of it and take a turn up and down among the sins of my past years. I do not think that I ever planned a sermon, that I did not take a turn around my study table and look back at the sins of my youth and of all my life and down to the present, and many Sunday mornings, when my soul had been cold and dry for the lack of prayer during the week, a turn up and down in my past life before I went into the pulpit always broke my hard heart and made me close with the gospel for my own soul before I began to preach. And if you're feeling cold and dry or distant from God, remember what Jesus has done for you. And this, this is really the key. This is why Paul said, I thank him who has given me strength. Look at what he did. Even though I was this, look what, what Jesus did. Even though I had hurt other people, even though I had sinned uh, intentionally, unintentionally, hurting others, hurting God, yet God has forgiven us. Paul Don said, said that, And the grace of the Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So Paul's past was forgiven. And now he's telling everyone about the amazing forgiveness of the mercy and grace of God. And he's thankful for it. Is, that's an example worth following. Amen? It really is. And so... Uh, we're going to have an opportunity. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. Actually, we'll have our worship team. If you guys will come on up here. And we just want to remember grace and mercy found at the cross of Jesus Christ. In him, we have our rest. Lord, we're, we're, we're still called. There's still consequences for sin. But we also know that we have grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. He's given us a wonderful way to remember that. What is it? It's communion. Do this in who do we remember as we take communion? We remember Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us and all that he's continuing to do in our lives. Would you stand, church, and we're going to pray and sing and worship. And uh, 
we'll head downstairs. So, Father, just uh, as we begin to open our lips, our mouths uh, to sing and to worship, we pray that we would do so with hearts that are not far from you but are close to you. Lord, we know that you have come, Lord, for all people, that you have come for each one that is here, that you have loved the world, that you have loved us, Lord, even demonstrating your love for us that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. So we pray, Lord, as we sing, that we would do so reminded of your great grace, Lord, that we would take our stand, Lord, as those who know that we are forgiven. But we know that it came at a great cost, Lord, not to us, but, but to you. Help us, like Paul, to be able to declare that I've poured out my life in response to that as an offering to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So before we go downstairs, I'd like to pray and, uh, and uh, maybe say a little grace for the, the meal we're going to have. Father, uh, we're just so grateful and thankful, Lord, that we can meet in this place openly and worship you. And Lord, that we know that you're here with us. So Father, as we go downstairs, Lord, to uh, partake in communion and then a love feast, Father, that you be with us. And Lord, we give you thanks for in all things. And we ask you to bless this meal to our body. We ask these things in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We'll leave down the center aisle. You're going to come downstairs. We'll have the elements for you right at the door. So just take those, find your seat, and we'll take them together. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>